I'll start by saying a very good morning to all the participants here so far. We expect to see more. Um, this is a webinar that we have postponed quite a number of times. So I am happy that today we finally get to uh, hear Professor Elk Martens from the University of um, New Brandenburg in Germany, University of Applied Sciences, New Brandenburg in Germany. Um, and then we'll have a panel of discussants, Professor Emmanuel Oladipo, as well as Professor Oluole Moreni Kiji. I will start with a little introduction. Um, as you are well aware, I think, this webinar is being organized as part of the 10th anniversary commemoration of WASCAL in FUT Mina. I don't want to spend too much time talking about WASCAL, but the program in Mina focuses on climate change and human habitat. In other words, it focuses on everything that has to do with our settlements, whether they are in urban areas or rural areas. As we are well aware, uh, we've been told that about in the, in the next 30 years, Africa's population is projected to double. And as it is, um, well, double to 2.5 billion people. And then the urban areas will be home to about 950 million of these people. Of course, that's a lot. Um, so it is hoped that the transition that we expect can accommodate this huge number uh, will be possible. And these are some of the discussions we are going to have today after we have been given a paper by a prof. And then in addition to that, we also are aware that climate change is, is on the front burner. We are also aware that urban areas are also affected. Even though Africa is said to have the harshest impacts, um, despite having low emission. So the solution, it seems, among others, is to go green. And that's the reason we have this interesting topic, uh, which says urban infrastructure in urban development in the era of climate change. So we have combined three very, very critical issues in a topic. Now, if you ask, why did we decide to do this? Because I recall when the pioneers of the Waskal PhD in climate change and human habitat were preparing their proposals, they wanted to do the normal thing, uh, urban growth and all of that. And I told them, look, this program intends to go further. That's the program in MENA intends to go further, not only to look at climate change, but also the issue of sustainability. We have seen places in Europe, in America, you know, going green. In West Africa, we are either not sure we can do it or we are crawling in a situation where uh, our counterparts in other countries have really gone very far. And to my surprise, the student told me, it's not possible in Africa. I will not call his name, I still remember him. He told me it's not possible in Africa. So it struck a chord and I decided not only to encourage them, but also to bring in experts to tell them what is going on in other places is also possible in Africa, but we need to do a lot. And that was what gave birth to this topic, which was aptly coined by Professor, by Elk. She says, I should call her Ilk. So I will start with an introduction 
of our guest speaker. Professor Dr. Ilk Martins is from the University of Applied Sciences in New Brandenburg, Germany. She's a professor of garden architecture and open space maintenance at the New Brandenburg University of Applied Sciences. And um, she will also tell us other areas of expertise herself, because sometimes it's better to let the speaker say a few words um, uh, by way of introduction. Joining her in discussing this topic are Professor Oladik Emmanuel, uh, Professor Oladipo, Emmanuel Oladipo, who is, of course, one of my mentors. And um, he is, if you want to hear insightful discussions on issues to do with climate change, he's one person you should listen to. So when Prof, uh, Professor Ilk um, Mertens gives us her presentation, he will come in to tell us about the climate change aspect. Uh, Professor Ladipo obtained his PhD in geography with specialization in climatology, but a focus on climate change, drought, and desertification about four decades ago from the University of Toronto, Canada. Uh, there are some of the students here whom I think were not existing four decades ago. So you can imagine, Prof got his PhD 40 years ago. Uh, he has worked with the United Nations Development Program in Nigeria um, between 1994 and 2006 as a Sustainable Development Advisor, and also led the Energy and Environment Team, during which he facilitated, among many others, uh, the revision of the country's policy on the environment and the production of the first national communication to the, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, FCCC. He was the regional coordinator of a GF, GEF assisted integrated ecosystem management project between uh, Nigeria and Niger between 2006 and 2012. The project implementation led to the restoration and rehabilitation of some management uh, some degraded areas and also established sustainable conditions for integrated ecosystem management for improvement of the livelihoods of the local communities um, and preservation of globally significant ecosystems in the transboundary catchment between Niger and Nigeria. Professor Moren Ikeji, Oluwole Moren Ikeji, is a professor of urban and regional planning at the Federal University of Technology, MINA. He became a full professor in 2006. He obtained his PhD in 1988 from the Federal University of, uh, Federal University of Technology, MINA. He won the Nigerian, Ital Nigerian Italian PhD scholarship, which enabled him to do part of his studies at the University of Trieste, Italy. He also won the Commonwealth Postdoctoral Fellowship, which he utilized at the University of Leeds, United Kingdom in 2004. He participated in, a, in an EU-funded project on, the pollution, on pollution discussion in uh, Leicester, UK. Um, Professor Moran Kedi participated in drafting of Vision 20, 2020, the aspect that has to do with urban and rural development thematic area. He served as the alternate secretary in that committee. Professor Moran Kedi was the deputy vice chancellor academic from 2016 to 2018 in the Federal University of Technology, MINA. He's a resource person at both WASCAL. Mina, as well as Waskal in Togo, in Togo. He has provided several PhDs and is co currently supervising a number of master's thesis. So you can see that our guest speaker and discussants are ably qualified to address the topic we're about to delve into. So having done this introduction, I will like to call upon Professor Ilk 
Mertens to first of all, tell us about herself a little bit more and then proceed with her presentation. Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for letting me uh, speak to you for the invitation. It is a really big honor for me to be part of um, yeah, Waskal and, and especially the 10th anniversary that you're celebrating. And this is just um, in my eyes, a very, very important project or, or um, not even a project, it's an ongoing thing, which um, yeah, is necessary to have. And um, don't expect too much from me. I still think that in a lot of countries, there is still a lot to do and um, you are just um, stepping on the, the um, thing that some, sometimes maybe in my country is even less easy to talk to people. And I'm really happy to see such a big group here in the room and also to recognize some of the students again. Um, hello, and um, thanks for coming again. So um, I will try to start my screen. And um, as Professor Lonya kindly said that I um, am working in the Brandenburg University of Applied Sciences. Um, so why now it changes. And okay, so I hope you can see the screen and you can hear me well. Um, I've been at the university um, as a professor for, for 25 years now, but before that I was trained as a gardener in a tree nursery, which really gave me a good input for uh, trees, vegetation as a whole, their needs and how to deal with them as then after my, my studies in landscape planning, which later on became landscape architecture. Um, this is just my, um, uh, yeah, my little um, Vita, but I I'm, have been um, specializing in my diploma thesis and in my PhD on urban climate. And as I was going to the university, attending the university in Berlin, at that time, we still had the wall around Berlin. It was all about urban climate, urban ecology, urban vegetation. So I dove into this topic. My topic today is green infrastructure and urban development in the era of climate change. I will um, change the structure a little bit around. You will see, I will start with the urban development and then come to green infrastructure um, in the era of climate change. But um, I think this is still understandable. Um, so my concept, uh, content, what you can expect is the, um, yeah, how this, urbanization changed the local climate. I think this is still a necessary to know um, topic. Before we talk about climate change, we do change the local climate anyway already um, with developing the, the land. And then climate change comes on top of that. Second point, third point is a little bit of explanation why green infrastructure can be a solution. And I agree that Professor Lonya, you said that it is one solution besides others. It's not the solution. So it's just one. And then I would like to give you selected case studies on how a city can develop. And then it does not only include green spaces, but a lot more because we green space is just part of a network, um, what a city really is. And then I'm really happy to get into this discussion, answer question and um, have your opinion on, on this. So when we start with a normal um, countryside or rural area, we have green space or open space, open land at least, and maybe a pond and maybe a forest. And 
then someone comes by and says, oh, this is a nice place. I will want to live there and build a house, maybe like this, maybe in another shape. And then he tells his neighbors or his former neighbors, friends, family, and then they say, oh, this is really a nice place. Let's live there. And then they live there and build another house and they, they say, okay, yeah, we, we need to work somewhere. So they build a factory or office space or whatever. And then it takes around and then a lot more people want to live there, want to work there. And then they say, oh, we need a mayor's home and government. And then we need a school. And so we need a lot of things for building up a city. And then they say, oh, it is so dirty when it is raining, let's build some streets. And finally, they seal almost all the area they had open land before. And then they say, okay, this is not so nice and we like to see some green space and they develop a park. The park has mostly nothing to do with the green space they had before, where when we, when we really have a good look at, the vegetation was native, the information of the seeds and roots are still in the ground, but now covered by all the sealing, uh, sealed surfaces. And the parks um, very often use different kinds of vegetation, trees, um, maybe not even native, and that might cause also some challenges in the end. This is just how, how things develop, you know about that. Um, and this is just a very small example. But what does it do? Just not concerning climate change at all, but only seeing what happens to the rainfall pattern. In the left side, like in the beginning, we have rainfall and the rain is soaked up by the, um, by the soil, more or less, it depends, of course, but then it can percolate, um, enrich groundwater and we have a natural water cycle, more or less. Um, whereas on the right side in um, cities, we have heavier rainfall. This is proved. It's, that's why I, why I put two clouds on top. Um, there is more rainfall in a shorter amount of time, very often. And then with all the sealed surfaces, the water doesn't know where to go, where to flow. The sewage system is very often not um well big enough for for heavy rains and then we get floodings we get damages through rainwater disturbed nature natural water cycle but the water cycle and rainwater is really a valuable good so we have to deal with it in another way this is about rainfall and the change of patterns but we also have a change of patterns with the um, sunshine and solar radiation in the former um, nice green area, we have a good ventilation. We have um, oxygen inside or outside the, the area. Um, everything goes well. We have a CO2 sink even, an O2 production. It is more humid and cooler and it gives us a rather healthy environment. Whereas radiation in cities lead to um, well, uh, warming up of the cities due to the uh, material that the buildings are made of, like concrete or steel, that heats up and the whole city gets warmer. Even the small green space in the middle cannot mitigate that very much. So it gets hot, dry, uncomfortable during warm and hot days, and it can become hazardous to health. That's why we um, talk about the urban heat island, uh, or UHI, that you already know, of course. Um, this is uh, also um, as a, a system, but it depends on the size of the city, where it is, the ventilation, and a lot about a lot of things. So we have to really deal with a single city, a single site, if we really um, introduce methods, but this is just the, the system that, that we can observe everywhere, more or less intensely. So um, the heat, urban heat island occur, effect occurs um, because rural areas can absorb the heat less 
So they, um, the radiation goes back to the atmosphere again, but the city's materials uh, absorb a lot of the heat that we get from the sun. Then the plants transport it, uh, and water evaporation from the soil is, of course, uh, bigger in rural areas and almost nothing in the city, almost not possible. And then there is almost no water penetration in the city area in, in comparison to the rural area. They say three to 10 degrees Celsius the, the city is hotter than the rural areas, and that really depends also. It is a, um, yeah, we can measure that. I did measure it for my PhD thesis. We did the Berlin Climate Atlas, where we uh, went through Berlin with a measuring uh, VW van uh, and measured everything. Nowadays, we um, construct the degrees more or less, but we can measure these things. And when we, this is also not one measuring, it's more a system that um, we can measure the day temperatures and night temperatures, of course, but we can also divide between surface temperatures. It's the line that is, um, let me see here, um, solid. And the not solid line is the air temperature. The air temperature is more um, affecting us, and it is not as um, different as the surface temperature, which really depends on if there is a building, uh, if there is green space, and so on. Uh, but we have the night temperatures, and the night temperatures affect us even a lot more because um, high temperatures are hazardous, to, can be hazardous to health. People, persons, mankind cannot adapt to um, heat at all in, in like in a certain range, um, but we can adopt to cold weather much better. So now it might be uncomfortable in our winter, but I can wear a jacket, I can wear another sweater or something, but um, constant heat and especially during night. So this is why the um, blue line is so important. In downtown areas, the night temperatures are higher, much higher than in the rural or suburban areas that you see here. And the water is just uh, balanced because it has another um, heat um, managing um, capacity. But the night temperatures, high night temperatures in areas where people try to sleep and relax uh, can be very stressful if they cannot sleep well. We call them uh, tropical nights when the night doesn't get, um, light temperature doesn't get lower than 25 degrees Celsius, I think. So you probably laugh about that, but it is stressful for us and we are not used to the heat but I think uh, it does have a limit for everyone. So this is really um, man-made, the, the dome of temperature above the downtown area, and it is crucial to help. When we have a look at uh, um, the correlation between developments of a city and temperature, now it's, is stuck a little bit, just uh, give me a second. Um, we can have a look at an example from Bangalore, which is exactly uh, researched. Hmm. Sorry about that. Let me see, it doesn't react here and um, I'm sorry. Let me, yeah. Um, let me sh stop real quick and I will try to, yeah. Um, 
Okay. I share again. Sorry for this. Um, um, so here you see uh, Bangalore. I, I on purpose did not uh, look for uh, an example from Africa um, because you are the experts there. I'm unfortunately not. So uh, I want to step away from telling you what needs to be done, but uh, I can I can give you examples of what I did my research on. So Bangalore um, was observed between 1973 and nine, uh, 2009. This um, research was um, published in 2010 already, so it's not recent, but the timeline is okay. And we see the red parts are the built up areas and we expected them to grow and we see they grew. And at the same time between um, 2000, uh, sorry, uh, 1992 and 2007, uh, we see three different temperature um, distributions over the city. And we see it does correlate, it does get more red, more red in this um, graph, in, in this image on the bottom, um, means that um, more red is hotter. And the hotter area is here in the hottest areas in the western part of Bangalore, where there is a dense, pop, uh, densely built up area. And this grows. So we see it was there before, but it does grow. And, and the growing can uh, also be a problem. So um, when we have a look at this, doesn't really go so well. Okay, now we have a look at uh, a site um, and I will enlarge this part. So here you see in one kilometer by one kilometer, uh, the big frame, how densely this city is built up and the small red square shows this um, yeah, enlarged picture. And we see that there is 76% um, roof area seen from the in the area photo. And there's only 1% white roofs. There is 2% open land, 4% green covers, and uh, the rest is roads. So um, really very densely built. And in the middle, we see the picture how high the buildings are how the widths of the street six meters by 12 meters and to the um, left so to the right side in the picture we see 12 meters and nine meters the buildings are made of concrete and also the road is a concrete road so all these surfaces um, take up a lot of heat from the sunlight and we don't see very much vegetation um, they have a height and width ratio, height of the houses and width between the houses of 1.75. This is really very dense and it's, it's residential. So this area is the area where people live and sleep and relax and get back to their strength to, to work during the next day. It's a north and south oriented street outline here. And this is what they observed. But um, just to, to get a picture of what these numbers can mean about um, dense, densely built up areas. Um, some of the undesirable effects of the urban heat island include, there's an increase in energy consumption for cooling. If we talk about air conditioning use, which is um, not so common in my country, but probably first thoughts in, in warmer countries. But then if, if we heat up the cities, then we need more energy. And here for us, we have an energy crisis right now because we have to import a lot of our energy um, resources which makes it very, very expensive because of the war in Ukraine and, and different political 
um, problems we have right now or the government has um, that sorry shall i continue okay i i think i will continue and then come back to the question thank you um so um we we say that one degree celsius to cool a room um temperature needs four times as much as to heat it up so it really would need a lot of energy for cooling which we could maybe decrease or should decrease then there is an increase in emissions of air pollutants that's um the the other um, effect then the greenhouse gases the ozone depleting refrigerants such as cfc's i will um, go over this quickly and not elaborate too much on this there's more information um, the demand on water is increasing. Um, people need more water, vegetation needs water. We do need wet vegetation and um, there, there is just more demand and water can become scarce. Then we have uh, to observe changes in ecosystems due to hot air and water temperatures. This is really crucial because we are not only in a climate climate crisis, but also in a biodiversity crisis. And I think we have to see it together that we do not do something good on one side, which harms the other side. So we have to see the whole system that we are living in. And it also affects the quality of life and health. And this is not the last or least. Um, it, it is very crucial that people should be able to live a healthy life and um, have a good well-being so these are the can be uh, these, the effects of um, heat uh, urban heat islands already and now we come to the climate change on top of the urban climate that um, is already a bit difficult sometimes and here I, I found this uh, this image, and I think it is giving um, a good overview of all the things that we know. We don't have to elaborate too much on that. The causes for climate change is rapid industrialization in the past, and not in Africa, but in other countries in the north. Um, the energy use we use so much energy, agricultural practices for meat production and so on, mostly. Um, deforestation, uh, which is really a big problem everywhere, I would say, but um, mostly in, in the Amazon region, which I hope comes to an end um, or more, more or less to an end um, in Brazil with the, new may, uh, with the new president, I hope. Then we have the livestock that produces methane. We have transport. Transport um, flights are uh, cheaper, and a lot of people, um, yeah, using use flights to go from one place to another. Um, we have the resource extraction. We have a lot of coal mines in Germany, um, brown coal and, and um, the coal underneath the soil. So that really is bad for our climate. We know that, but we still do it and we have a lot of pollution. The effect is in general rising temperatures. Uh, we know that, but it also differs from place to place. And we have the, the rising sea levels due to the melting of the icebergs um, and the unpredictable weather, weather patterns due to the changing jet stream. Uh, it's not as strength, strong anymore as it used to be. We have an increase in extreme weather events, which the cities need to withstand and become resilient towards. Then we have land degradation. Uh, we have a loss, lot of oh, sorry, loss of wildlife and biodiversity. This is really, in my eyes, also a big problem we have to address. And then we can get a lot of um, social impacts like displaced people, poverty, loss of livelihood, hunger, malnutrition, increased risk of diseases, 
global food and water shortages. And I think this, this word global is important for me because we can only solve the climate crisis together, not in a singular project. But we have to look at our neighbors as well. Um, now, so this is the, the global viewpoints of um, climate change. But what about cities? So cities are drivers of global climate change and at the same time also affected by climate impacts. And that um, yeah, probably happens to everyone, but cities are um, have good aspects. I mean, they bring a lot of people together. There, there's a, a lot of um, action going on which is not distributed all over the whole land and, and um, distances are shorter in cities, but still they are drivers and affected at the same time. And cities are vulnerable to um, increased temperature and more frequent um, and more intensive heat waves. This is a problem here in Europe, I would say. Um, we are also vulnerable to more frequent, more intense, heavy precipitation. We have a lot of floods um, and our sealed surface is so, well, the, the um, factor is so high and it gets higher every day um, that we do have problems with heavy precipitation and floods. Um, then flooding due to sea level rise more or less of course affects um, more the, the cities closer to the sea and there is a change in precipitation patterns and more frequent or intense droughts so we have less rain for example in summer we have more rain in winter um, but we have less rain at all and sometimes we have heavy rainfall so the existing infrastructure, especially in developing cities, is often in substandard quality and thus fails to provide adequate protection from extreme weather events. I think this is really what we have to have in mind to reduce the urban heat island as much as we can and still think about what happens when a flood comes, what happens when a heat wave comes, what can we do? And a city is resilient if it can buffer um, the, the extreme weather events. Um, so here, this is uh, how climate will change um, the cities by 2050 and more in the viewpoint of a Northern European or Northern American viewpoint. They say that the climate will change, like it will go up or will go down. Um, like, um, Madrid will get the climate that Marrakesh has had before, and London will get the climate Barcelona has had. And so we see these changes. For us, it's um, quite a lot, but when we see that in Europe, cities will be warmer by 3.5 degrees Celsius in summer and 4.7 degrees Celsius in winter, um, this does not at all meet the 1.5 degree target. And 77% um, of the world's cities will experience a striking change in climate. That's a lot, three thirds. And 22% of the cities globally will experience novel climate conditions. So whatever that might mean, we have to examine that individually. Each city has to set up a climate plan. Um, but what, what could we do about it? And I told you I, I was trained as a gardener and my observation was maybe one solution could be green infrastructure. There is a positive effect of uh, vegetation like um, it is above ground, but also below ground. As I said, there is the root system of a tree as big as the crown and what we see above. So always if you see a tree, think about the root system that it might have. Um, it reflects, absorbs, and intercepts radiation. It shades the ground, whatever ground we have. We have a cooler temperature. We have a better, um, nicer climate, more humid and cooler inside the vegetation or below the crowns of the trees. 
we have transpiration respiration which also cools the temperature and we have rainwater interception and also percolation is better so then we have the water uptake for transport transpiration from the roots and that is transported to the atmosphere to the air which we also feel uh, in the green areas um, this is um, a few things and why do we talk about green infrastructure maybe this is still a quite new term for um, some people um, it we know that infrastructure is necessary to keep a system running it's the catalyst maybe and we talk about gray infrastructure three tracks sewage systems public buildings cables all these things that we need but then we also talk about social infrastructure schools hospitals universities uh, elderly homes and so on and then the green people said so green um is vegetation is so necessary but we are not well observed and we we are not asked to um, give our input to climate change issues or whatever to the development of cities they always neglect that they need open spaces and green spaces and that's why we say um, green infrastructure is all kinds of vegetation with ecosystem services for people's well-being. It's like parks and gardens for biodiversity. It can be um, a bigger space and a smaller site. And for climate change mitigation and adaptation, of course, it is it does cooling. It regulates the water cycle. It reduces greenhouse gases and protects from wind or um, maybe we, we need the ventilation better. So this is why people call for like only maybe 10 years or so. Um, the function, if green has a function, then they call it infrastructure, green infrastructure, um, to um, make clear that we cannot do without. Um, the recommendations for the development of urban areas in respect to climate change and green infrastructure um, are just a longer list. I will keep it short. Um, I changed it a little bit and added things like promoting green cover of vegetation wherever possible, including houses, buildings, whatever. Um, green facades, rooftops are, are really mandatory because also green facades cool the facade a lot and then the facade cannot heat up as much and the climate will um, maybe stay cooler than insulation of green roofs with water retention we can keep the water on the rooftop for a while um, it's also better for the vegetation on that rooftop then and if we cannot make it green plus of course photovoltaic is also very good the pv uh, re, um, energy production uh, works a lot better on a green roof than on a black roof. But if nothing is possible, just color the roof white. It's most important, I think. Then um, we need to think about our, uh, our streets. Designing green streets is important. It's not that the streets are painted green, but they need to have water retention bodies at the ends, at the edges. They need to have... Um, uh, street trees along the the sides they need to have the um yeah coolness cooling and shading system of the grounds um so that's why we need to um, develop a canopy for shaded grounds for for having shaded grounds to um, reduce the heating um, of, of the surfaces and uh, also, we need to shade parking lots, any any um, site, because then it doesn't heat up as much and um, it doesn't heat up the cars so much. But I would also call for reducing cars um, and private traffic in cars. And then we need the water bodies, which we um, could also call green infrastructure. Some people say it is green and blue infrastructure, and I think uh, this is necessary to green doesn't work without um, water. So um, when I talk about green infrastructure, I mean the green and blue at the same time. Um, 
here we have the comparison between a gray and a more green city. It is still a city, it still functions as a city, but it has a lot of aspects like green roofs and trees on the rooftops, which sometimes happens and sometimes is not allowed. Um, then we have the percolation of the water into the groundwater. So keeping the water on site is important. Rainwater is a very important um, thing to have and keep. And um, so living shorelines and, and percolation of pavements is also important to have. This is an example of the United States when, and they give examples of what they observed in the United States. Like they, um, with the green roof, they reduced the energy they needed for cooling the top floor inside. Um, that does happen, but it also prevents um, that the uh, heat goes out, uh, out in, in winter when we have to heat the rooms. Then we have to capture um, local water, build coast, coastal resiliency. So they have measured a lot of things in different areas. So it's not, it doesn't apply to one city, uh, all, all these aspects. But um, they had a 93% reduction of runoff volume um, after the installation of 17 rain gardens. Um, and that's really good. So this is green infrastructure. Reduction of run runoff volume is really important when we have floodings. And we use less energy for cooling and can sleep better um, when we have um, trees around us. So for our first example, we can um, check this. And I just painted it a little bit green, but with green facades and green roofs, and permeable streets, we can improve a city's climate much, much better. There are even more aspects than just having a cooler and more humid um, city. If we, if we do it, um, yeah, as, as you, you do um, nicely, we have a lot more advantages around the, this, this green cities. Um, we have an aspect like food security, which um, in some areas, some countries is an, uh, an important factor. Even in Canada, it is an important factor, which I didn't know before I learned about that. Then we can re, um, reduce the excess mortality due to um, heat waves or heat. And we in our country and in other countries in Europe have excess mortality in summertime. What we sometimes don't, um, don't have a look at really, don't observe so much. We can enhance biodiversity. We can see um, which microclimates we have to develop. We can also foster social equality, which I think is uh, just very necessary in any democratic society, we can foster health, and we can do something for climate mitigation. But then I say, I think this is would be another <clears throat> webinar, but um, the students will know the proper installation of green, like how to plant a tree, which tree to plant, um, how to take care of it in the first we year. We are one government, we are one people. Are we off, out of time? Okay, um, so this is very important. And the next one, adequate maintenance over the next decade is really very, very mandatory. If that is not uh, secured, then we, we um, have, yeah, not a sustainable situation, what we need. And I didn't elaborate too much on that now, but I wanted to mention it that it is very important. I would like to go um, for a very short amount of time and very quickly uh, over two site examples, research examples from my research I did um, recently, a few years ago, uh, four years ago. I was in Medellin. Medellin is in Colombia, second largest city. 
And here, I think there is a nice network. It used to be the most dangerous city in the world. And about 20 years ago, they recovered from that, had a very, or a row of very intelligent mayors. And the first thing, like you see, it is in the, lying in the valley. The um, bottom is about 10 kilometers long, and then um, it climbs up the hills to all sides, which causes problems because they have the informal settlements on the um, upper areas of the city. And what they did is they installed a train line in the north-south direction. It is a um, high, high line uh, thing, not a subway because that would have been too expensive. Um, then from that on, um, they, they installed trams and this is a shared space for everyone and the tram goes by and they also installed bike lanes, protected bike lanes in a way. A little bit of green space, not too much, not too good, but at least an attempt. And I think a very good attempt. And then up the hills, they installed these cable, um, yeah, cable cars, cables um, to go up the hills. So to bring the people up to there where, where they live in the settlements. And then from, from there, they can go down much, much more quickly to where they work and where they uh, want to buy things or so. So it did reduce a lot of traffic. And here in this development um, settlement here, they, it is very, very densely built up and they installed roller coasters for people to go up and down more easily, especially for elderly people, it is a, of great help to have that. So it is very modern, very, very, um, yeah, modern, I think, um, and good for the people. And the tickets are not as not very expensive, so people can afford them. And they also um, profit from the reduction of two, CO2 emissions and they can um, save up to 20,000 tons of CO2 per year as a city because they reduce the bus traffic and private traffic. And um, with this uh, reduction, they um, go with the emissions ratings of CO2 emissions and can pay for the transport system, um, at least for part of it. So another thing, so this is not nothing about green, but it is part of the network the city has to think about, transporting people. And another thing is to the left side, we, well, we see one hill. This used to be a dump hill. I go very quickly over it. You see there, there used to be 15,000 people living on that hill looking for goods to sell. And then they had fires and difficulties and really bad situation and they improved it a little bit um, after having uh, closed it and they made a green garden for this Moravia is the most densely populated area in Medellin and they made a garden for the people. Uh, unfortunately like when I was there um, it was a garden it was more like that and I show you a picture um, that I took this I did not take um, I took from them, but um, people were very proud of that. It was really very nice. And last night, my son just returned from a travel um, and he also stayed in Moravia. And he said, yeah, but now they have, um, um, they have built new houses here. They developed this hill illegally probably and now it's gone. So it is not well enough protected, unfortunately. And that was just my, my news news. It used to be like that. And now we have developments there that are not um, wanted really. And that's what they have to solve now. Uh, but it is a big change for the people. And then we have a new house, a new building. It's a business and innovation center. I think that's just um, urban. And we see a lot of green in between the staircase and uh, here. So this is the way into the courtyard. And from the outside, we see the facade is 
it has a, a different shape, a very nice shape, but an interesting shape. And why that? We see that um, the facade distributes the radiation, the sunlight, into the interior that they can live with normal sunlight, natural light over a very long period inside this building. And um, then we have this courtyard here and they have a green facade on that side. Uh, so what does it do? The warm air comes through the inner courtyard, is taken, flows between like in the, in the green facade and then into the building in each floor and is released again through the verandas. So um, there is a, I, I show you this example because I think green is not only without buildings. It's not only rooftop or facade. It has to do with the exchange between building and outside. And in, in this case, it does function. In our cases, we have to insulate a lot uh, more. So we cannot exchange too much with the outside, but I think it's a good example. And it's also um, uh, nice. So here you see the courtyard again with all the native plants. They use a lot of native plants and the university botanic people um, opposite the street. And here we see the um, green facade. It is not plants growing on the stones. It is just a structure in front of um, the, the original facade. So there is air in between and this is cooling the and, and refreshing the air that is taken into the building. Um, my last example is um, just one project in Vancouver in Canada. You see a lot of high rise buildings, a lot of glass. Um, and Canada has, um, has hosted the Olympic Games, um, winter Olympic Games in um, and, and the sports people lived in the Millennium Water Village, uh, which was newly developed for this event. And what, what we see is a lot of green things on the plan already. Um, the, this was meant to be used during the games and afterwards as residential buildings, of course. And here we see a lot of like courtyards and gardens on top of roofs uh, of houses and green roofs, like maybe yellow, but this should be green uh, sometime. Um, it, it was a special plant they used for, for uh, the Olympic games. We have water features here on top of the parking garage and also in the courtyards, a lot of, a lot of water features. And the critical thing about this is the water is used in the open space in each courtyard and it has a lot of little waterfalls. What they do is they, um, yes. they collect the rainwater and um, uh, store it in cisterns, so it's called like a rainwater harvesting, which is very important not to let the rainwater go when it comes from the, the sky. Um, they collect it, they put it into these features, so it is circulated and so put with oxygen, so it stays in a good quality. And they have to deal with the fact that they get most rain in winter time and mostly no rain in the summertime. So they um, use the water that the excess water they get in the winter time for flushing the toilets inside the building, which I think is very smart because then they don't have excess water that to throw away, which is good rainwater. In summer, on the other opposite side, they need the water, the excess water for irrigation. And since they don't have enough rainwater maybe sometimes, or they have a um, longer period without rain, they may use, um, get from the city the amount of water they saved in winter time because they used rainwater for flushing the toilets. And then this amount can um, the city give them for um, irrigation of the green spaces and filling up their water cycles. So I think 
also there's a maybe more um, uh, capitalistic way of thinking about resources, but it at least it is not thrown away. And I think, yeah, it looks good and maybe can be an uh, example for a good use of rainwater. More on that um, is in the references for the uh, little images and other images are referenced in the slides directly. Um, and this book is um, a compilation of my research I did on the resiliency of cities with green infrastructure or landscape architecture. And um, thank you for your patience and attention very, very much. I hope I didn't use too much of your time. <clears throat> thank you very much, Silk, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, you kept to time. We said 45 minutes, so <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I, I, I hope we can take one or two questions for you directly before we go into the discussion session. Uh, please, thank you for joining us uh, during this um, very interesting webinar, a webinar that intends to educate us in very simple terms what, about what is going on uh, in other places as they try to find solutions to climate change as it impacts them. Like we said, such ourselves going green. So having said that, um, if there are questions for Prof, please quickly type them so that we can ask her, or you may wish to raise your hand, just two questions. If you have any, you may wish to raise your hand and then we will uh, call you to quickly give your questions. So I don't see any raised hands. Okay. There's one. Professor mm -hmm. Okone. Professor Okone, aha. Professor Okone, before you ask, this is my boss. Professor Okone is my boss <laughs> in uh, Waskal. I, I work directly with him as a director uh, Waskal Climate Change and Human Habitat. So, Professor Kone, please, your question, please unmute your video. Ralph, uh, spotlight him so that we can see him. Hey, man. If you unmute, okay, I want him to unmute his video. Good morning. Good morning, Prof. Yeah, good morning, Prof. Uh, good morning also, all our speakers. I really want to, do I have the floor? Yes, please. Okay, thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor and also for this uh, big, big uh, webinar. I think uh, it's very interesting for us to learn also and also to see how we can also improve what we are doing so far in our daily uh, activities. We are all, uh, uh, I can say we will all build uh, one day something. So doing that, uh, we need to learn and also to see how to guide our people. Thank you so much for this uh, organization. And I want also to thank uh, all the uh, speakers uh, who will be during this meeting and also all the participants. Uh, my question is uh, uh, really to ask uh, about uh, this green uh, building, because uh, sometimes maybe when we talk about the green, 
uh, is it uh, bringing green solution or is it only about uh, vegetation? I think uh, I've seen also it's not only that, but I've seen uh, there's a lot of uh, ways where we can um, achieve uh, a building and talk about the green building or green infrastructure. I'm sure it's not only about uh, uh, the landscape uh, occupation by uh, trees and also others. This is my first question. And the, the second one is also what kind of advice can we have now in terms of, uh, we see a lot of uh, cities where people are now uh, doing agriculture uh, activities. It can, like, it can be like uh, urban agriculture. Uh, is it only a way where we can guide this uh, urban agriculture? So that means uh, where we can also take benefit of that and have a green city uh, in terms of uh, bringing green solution uh, to also tackle the issue of climate change. Those are my two questions. I don't know if uh, I've been understood. Yeah, thank hey, you. <laughs> yeah, may, may I um, try to give my opinion on that? I, it's not really a question, it's more good, um, very important addition. Um, okay. I do think that green buildings um, need a lot more um, sustainability inside them than we usually um, provide them with. I'm not an architect, but uh, I see a lot of buildings could use more thoughts on um, how they function, how they work, like second water cycle to use rainwater or wastewater in the toilets would be very easy, is well known already, but no one really um, implies it in my observation in my country. So uh, I, I think very often we have a rooftop that is maybe made green, but it doesn't have much to do with the building itself. So I think we should develop this further. And that's why I showed you the two examples where building and green space are better interconnected. Um, it, it's really something, a wide field that needs more development, I think. Um, but also to keep the vegetation alive and green needs water, needs maintenance, needs, uh, needs care. And um, that's also a big um, yeah, thing that we have to manage. Um, about the urban agriculture, thanks for mentioning this. Uh, topic. I left it out, um, but I learned from the students last year. I was teaching this module, Green Infrastructure, and um, it was really very interesting and, and so important. We have urban gardening um, projects, which are more or less a social aspect um, of the city. Uh, I think in your countries, you have a lot more um, need for, for um, really producing produce that can be um, feeding uh, the, the people and, and even sold to them to the, in the surrounding. So this is really what we um, work on to reduce the transport um, distances bringing in um, our goods from, from the outside of the city to towards the inner city. Um, but it, it has a lot of good aspects. You produce something you can eat. You teach people how to do that. As, especially here, we, we need to do that. Like some kids say, oh, this carrot comes out of the dirt. I cannot eat it. Um, this is a bit um, train, uh, strange, uh, but it does happen. So educating people, also telling them the value of um, the, the vegetable or fruit that we get from the earth. Um, and, and it also has a climate aspect and it, it is part of green infrastructure, yes. Um, and I, I would like to, to see a lot more of that. Maybe I met your your points a little bit but I yes, so yes, uh, uh, yes um, I'm very happy again uh, congratulations it's a very uh, good talk but I want to think also about um, incorporation of uh, maybe renewable uh, renewable technology in uh, our 
when we are doing our buildings, I think this also can give also uh, a lot of uh, green uh, solution. In addition of the transportation you talk about, um, I was very happy to see how also using some transportation facility, we can also reduce the green uh, houses gas production. So thank you so much. Prof, thank back you. to you, congratulations. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, one more question for Professor Elk. Um, okay. Uh, let me uh, let me still welcome all our participants, and then you'll find this very interesting when you ask questions. I see Professor Lorna, uh, Dr. Till, and a number of my colleagues joined in. You're all welcome. My students, my schoolmates, my uni mates, my second. You are all there. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, okay, now, Professor Ilk has, um, Professor Martins, okay, let me just call her by her first name, Ilk, has um, presented to us what should really uh, give us some food for thought in terms of what we can do in our part of the world. Uh, she mentioned a bit of what climate change is doing and how it is impacting the urban areas. So I would want Professor Oladipo to tell us more in addition to what we have learned from Elk. Professor Oladipo, tell us more. I know you you are you make presentations and then you incite us, incite in the sense that you get us thinking. I want you to, I'm not too sure how many of us in the audience really appreciate the impact climate change is having on us, especially in urban areas. So I would want you to share with us your a bit of your knowledge in the next, say, five minutes. Prof? All right, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, may I first of all congratulate uh, Waska Kuta, I mean, put for this meeting and thank Professor Elk seriously for simplifying a very complex uh, topic. Uh, in the sense that uh, the urban settlements have their own peculiarities, even without climate change. When combined with climate change, the peculiarities become more extreme. And therefore, the importance of situating urban development within the context of present climate conditions and anticipated future climate conditions cannot be underestimated. This regard, I really want to thank her very much. I, ironically, the, there were two or three slides uh, which uh, she shared on the green infrastructure on climate resilience, which I was trying to brag about, but she had already presented that. And that's very good that you know, we all think about it. There's no doubt anymore. Climate change has become a reality. We are all witnesses to what happened last year all over the world in pakistan in nigeria in many parts of the globe what is happening in california now what is uh, happened in many uh, other places uh that me uh, you want to see, see my face i was thinking yes, that no. the the bandwidth may not be so big so but if you want to see my face that's not the problem you can see my face briefly, but I think the bandwidth is a bit narrow. So if we don't show, uh, let me see. Yes, briefly. Yeah. Can you unmute my video, bro? Rob? Can you do that? I can. Uh, okay. Can you see my face now? Um, there I am. There's the. All right. Can you still hear me? All right. That's it. 
So uh, if we agree that the urban environment is unique on its own, and now we are witnessing a major challenge, and I can see what happened in uh, California in the last two days, because some of these terms we are looking at there, the actually as a result of the warming of the Pacific. And by the time the affect urban environment in particular, the huge amount of losses in the experience in California showed clearly the need to take the issue of uh, urbanization seriously. In the case of Nigeria, for instance, we are expecting that Nigeria in the next uh, 10 years or so, we overtake America uh, and become the third most populous country in the world uh, after India and China. Uh, if that happens, and since Nigeria is highly urbanized, especially in the southern part of the country, a place like Lagos, then what do you do? Because it means more and more people have to settle in these areas and all the rest. So there's no doubt again, again, that the impact of climate change become more extreme, especially as we're expecting the temperature conditions to continue to increase to, to, towards the end of the century. There's nothing, of course, you can do, no matter how much we even shut down the greenhouse gas emissions, this change that has started will continue for a long period of time to come. So I think what uh, Professor Epp did today is to actually uh, uh, arouse our consciousness on the need to really take an uh, issue of uh, climate change, I mean, uh, green infrastructure into climate change uh, response. And I really love the aspect of this, let's turn it around. What she showed was the green infrastructure for building resilience, but the turn it around that even green infrastructure helps to really, I mean, it helps, it promotes climate resilience. And one of the things that we really need to do now is to really learn from a number of examples that you give. I think the example of Medellin in Colombia is closer to Nigeria than Vancouver. Uh, and we should be able to look at that one. I just want to mention what we need to do. I think what we need to do is the need for what Professor Eric tried to do, that is to emphasize stronger focus on integrated spatial planning and methods to stimulate this very cross-sectoral uh, 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 events, issues between the urban buildings, urban settlement, the open spaces, and the rural urban, uh, the sub rural areas that are existing there. There's a need to understand that uh, and then to put uh, spatial planning as a major. Unfortunately, the many urban uh, centers in Nigeria to replan is a bit difficult now. And so we have to really try to adjust to some of the things that Lagos State has tried to do by creating from very narrow roads, what you call the BRT again, that is the bus uh, rapid transit uh, routes, which allows massive uh, buses to go rapidly without uh, being uh, uh, slowed by the usual traffic jam, thereby conveying more people and at the same time reducing the amount of emission that can come over. We need to have more good examples of uh, this uh, uh, green infrastructure, how they operate and what are the benefits. For instance, many, we are not popularizing enough in Nigeria. The type of green infrastructure that uh, Dangote was uh, uh, supported to build between the Apapa port and uh, through Oshodi, all the way to seven up area, which is more or less made up of uh, concrete cement and to try to control, because we have to understand what green infrastructure means. Green infrastructure is the ability to use our resources to control how the water affects us and also use the water to show how we can improve on ourselves. And that's where Professor X uh, uh, remembrance of the need to include blue came in very important because it's all what we need to do. We must have more examples of that. We must be able to show more evidence of what the benefits of this things are. If we can do all those ones, then people will be more interested. And of course, we need more investment in this uh, green infrastructure development. What we cannot, uh, what we should not forget, for instance, 
is the, the, the rapid rate at which we are developing our urban areas in Nigeria in a half of a, 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 a bad manner. Uh, Abuja that was supposed to be well planned, we all now seem the chaos. And everybody, every attempt to build a two bedroom, three bedroom bungalow separately by individual would not work because there's hardly any land left now between the radius of about 80 kilometers of Abuja anymore. So how long can we do that? So definitely we end up having to rethink the, uh, the, the, the urbanization strategy of this region and to see how we can uh, focus on using the green approach to make a lot of things to work. For instance, the example of uh, food security. Many uh, buildings in uh, Japan and other rest, from what I understood, have not been there, but people are trying to even produce rice uh, on their balconies uh, so that they can eat. They have rice regularly from the balcony. And that's what the Medellin example was trying to show that you can even have a building and still to put a lot of things around it and can help you to even get some fruits, you know, from there and all the rest. Uh, the idea of trying to be the whole area of our land, because land is very costly, may not continue to succeed. I think I want to, I don't want to dilute the very rich uh, approach that uh, Professor Elk has put in. I just want to leave with one or two more things. The informality of our development in Nigeria is going to be a major challenge. And how you how we deal with this one, and that's what one of the things that a WASCA student can start thinking about, uh, the informal sector, urban development, and climate change. If you can try to find how to do a research and how the informal sector can be improved upon to make uh, integration of, of green infrastructure for urban development as a means of mitigating and adapting to climate change will be an interesting area. That informality must be done. Professor Eck, I just want to find out from you before I conclude the idea of a, this roof for retaining water, the installation of green roofs for with water retention uh, may be a good idea. But are there any specific studies on the hydrological implications of such approach? Because if you don't allow the water from the roots to go back into the system, how much of impact are we going to have on the hydrological cycle? Which in the long run can also affect how our climate respond to the changes in the hydrological cycle that we want to create. So I want to thank you because uh, we are dealing with a very complex, very difficult uh, uh, interrelationships uh, to know exactly what makes a building, what makes the building environment much warmer. This is because of the very complex radiation and radiation effects of the building themselves, apart from the energy that comes from the sun that they try to absorb. Thank you very much, and I think uh, it's a good beginning, uh, but we need more. Uh, Thank you, what I want, uh, want some of the Pascal people to ask our students to possibly go and uh, work with uh, Professor Eck and come back to Nigeria with uh, good ideas as to how we can really use our informal urban development and transform them into green uh, uh, infrastructural development that can help us reduce the impact of climate change, help us to adapt to climate change, help us to build our resilience to address the challenges of urban flooding and other uh, extreme weather related events that may be affecting us as the climate continues to work in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Oladipo, for your thoughts. And um, you have told us we need a few things. We need to do a few things like um, there must be integrated spatial planning and methods. We need more examples to learn from. Um, and, I, and I believe, I also agree with you very, very firmly there. It's easier to learn from the mistakes of others than to be a pioneer. So since people have pioneered green infrastructure, we can learn from them to pick what is relevant to us. You also mentioned investment. 
Government, I agree with you completely. People say government do this, government do that. Government can't do everything. At least we've heard of what Dongote is uh, trying to do. More of private individuals should come into this. In fact, if you ask me, I think anybody trying to set up any business or anything now should be tax, tasked with going green, should be you know, encouraged to go green. Could decide the government could decide to reduce the taxes or something just to encourage people to go green. So thank you very much, Professor Oladipo. You mentioned something that I think Professor Ilk can say a few words on, Prof. Oh yeah, good morning. You okay. Yes. Yeah, you have clothes for now. Yeah. Okay. Professor Ilk. Yes, it's um, I, I hear some voices. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Oladipu. I can only agree to all that you pointed out. I, I know it's not easy, and I did talk more about the systems and so on, but I really um, like to collect uh, life examples, good examples. Yes, we can learn from mistakes of others, but I am, um, yeah, we may make simple mistakes, but we have to follow a line, I think. And um, yeah, it, it, you mentioned the urbanization planning system, and this is um, about, I'm sorry about uh, my very short answer, Dr. Vincent Ollier, also in the chat. Um, uh, I think we have a very strong planning system in Germany and I'm used to that, but um, it, it's crucial. It's just the starting point. Where is the industry going to be situated? Where is um, forest to be protected? Where is any open land? And where is open place for, for densification of a city with green spaces um, impl implemented? So, yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for this um, practical addition about your country. And I really like to, to know more about it and to see it more better. I read a lot about it, but I do not want to tell you what I read about because you experienced and um, you are the experts on that. So um, yeah, thank you for, for teaching me these things. I totally agree to what you said. Thank you, uh, El. So, um, once again, thank you, Professor Ladipo. We'll still come back to you. Um, Professor Maureen Ikechi. Yes. Uh, we, have been, we have been told that in the next few years, population in urban areas will double the current number in Africa. That sounds very scary to me because um, there are, we have urban areas already existing and then if the population is going to double in such areas or increase in such areas, what do we do? What are we going to do? How on earth are we going to adjust to accommodate those the increase in population, because already some of our cities seem to be overloaded. I don't know how to say it, but they, I mean, it's like they've, they've reached their carrying, they've exceeded their carrying capacity. And yet we know that um, we're expecting the population to increase. So how do we, what do you advise? How do you, how do you advise us to go about this? so that um, we will still have places to call home that are not um, unlivable. Yeah, thank you, Director. Thank you very much for facilitating this webinar. And thanks to Professor LK and uh, Professor Ladipo for topping up. Let me start by saying that um, the case studies presented by LK actually reflects what is going on also in Nigeria. Look at the statistics from uh, Bangalore in India. 
Prof, Star. Prof, yeah. Could yeah. you unmute your video so no, that we I, can? I'm not, on, I'm not okay on video. Yes. Yes. The 525 percent growth in built-up area within 40 years in Bangalore is scary. To the extent that uh, the vegetation declined by 78 percent and water bodies by 79 percent. And then um, the other case study of a uh, Bashewasha Naga, where we have 75 percent built up. These are not different from what we are experiencing currently in Africa. Ibada in Nigeria, Lagos, Portacot, Kano, or Dhaka in Senegal, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, Kinshasa, all are experiencing this. And it's not as if you don't know the solution. As somebody has rightly said, in Nigeria in particular, we are very, very long on policies, but very short on implementation. A lot of research work has been done about the future of uh, urban areas in Nigeria. As far back as early 1970s, Professor Mabogudi has noticed the problem of industrialization, urbanization, and motorization. The early warning have been sounded, but what have we done about it? Again, apart from the new cities like Abuja and some other areas in the existing city that are planned, hardly do we have any state capital, talk less of any urban centers in Nigeria that have master plans. A sitting governor can invest 1.7 billion, 2 billion on personal house, but none of them is ready to spend 50 million naira to provide a master plan for 300,000 people. So look at other things that we are copying. We are talking about green belt, we are talking about tree planting. Every year, government spend a lot of money planting trees, but the population, the people, we go back and cut these trees down for fuel wood. The cost of petrol, the cost of kerosene, the cost of cooking gas have gone up, and we are now talking about a green area, green cities. All the trees planted by roadsides, people are going there to cut the back of the trees to make medicine, to cure typhoid. So unless we eradicate poverty, unless we educate our people, it's not as if they are not affected by the effects of a climate change. The flooding that we see every year, people know the causes, but they are helpless. So unless we eradicate hunger, poverty, and the cause down on um, um, embezzlement of public funds, funds meant to improve livelihood, to improve urban area. So I want to say that we have all the solutions. We see what other advanced countries are doing, but the political will to implement is not there. We come up with good policies every year but we are always very short on implementation. Um, so this, this is just the problem. When we build new towns, we know that they are supposed to be green belts. We are sup we're supposed to, to put a satellite towns. The satellite towns are supposed to have some people going into the big cities. But these satellite towns are where they find cheap houses. The people still travel to the main city to go and walk. So all these problems are with us. We know about the solution, but we don't have the political will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mori Keji, for your response. Again, these are things we should think about. Um, at least we are listening. 
So well, if we have access to those that ought to um, put in place policies to guide our implementation, please, uh, you should let them know. Uh, we don't want to keep all these things to ourselves here. That is why we call for webinars and all of that to share with you what we are seeing and hopefully hear from you uh, questions about things going on that um, you, you want to know more about. So having said that, if you have questions for both Professor Oladipo and Professor Moreni Keji, I'll take two per uh, Prof, please ask. In the meantime, I see a question here. It says finances are of the essence. Where can people get the finances from? Is it re readily available? Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about climate change, climate finance. So I don't know uh, which one of our discussants will want to respond to that. All right, the, Prof. The yes is it's very common that in every situation where there's a challenge, our first port of call is finance. But what are you financing? That's the first thing. Do we really understand the complexity of this thing very well first? So to me, the first point is the what you are doing. Let us understand the intricacies involved in rapid urbanization in the face of climate change. And then what can be done? Well, we know this very well. Put in a good policy like what Paul was saying, put in a good implementation strategy, put in uh, all other things, then develop the financing strategy for the implementation of that site and very long way. And in case of climate finance, there are a lot of opportunities now. We have what is called the Green Bond in Nigeria, the National Climate Change Law, which came into effect in November 2021, is going to also establish a climate change board. We are hoping that where that fund comes up, it will be genuinely, and that's the key issue, genuinely used for developing infrastructure that can really help to improve the climate resiliency of the country. We also, we have also part of the global system in which there's what we call the climate change, uh, the Green Climate Fund, which is made up of both concessionary and uh, grant fund. And a lot of in private sectors are putting together a huge amount of money that are likely to be available. There's what to call investment one, in the investor one, investor two coming up, where a number of private companies and financial institutions are trying to put together a huge amount of resources that may be made available. And with government backing, government good policy, government uh, commitment, uh, private sector people may be able to access some of this through government uh, approval and then use them for the proper development. We also have a good opportunity now in what is uh, what happened about two weeks ago uh, in Davos, in which the uh, great economies are trying to put together about three trillion dollar package towards addressing the challenge of climate change. I'm not saying that they just go through the money. If it is available for uh, concessioning to some developing countries, there will be a lot of conditions attached, a lot of uh, uh, guidelines will be given. Uh, even with the Green Climate Fund, even with our Green Bond, there are a lot of guidelines and so on. So I think the best is to try to, first of all, understand the landscape, the climate finance landscape of Nigeria, which will be available. Uh, we are working on what we call the long-term development strategy now for Nigeria, and it's likely that there will be a section of that. But even then, the Minister of Finance has a climate finance expert or advisor that is advising the government of Nigeria on this. But I don't think government is popularizing that very well. So the finance is so thing. But the first thing is, let us understand what is happening. And one of the things that people may not understand is 
the what Equa Atlantic is trying to do was a private investment. It's not Lagos State government using this money. It's a private investment by Shira Group, group or something. And they are trying to make sure that they develop the infrastructure along the coast, because that's part of the green infrastructure, along the coast to be able to check the massive coastal erosion that has been affecting Victoria Island all along and see if they can vent up the, the anger of the sea, as we call it, you know, the sea level rise that they can use. And part of the, some of the things that I believe they are doing there is because part of the green infrastructure, it also includes uh, energy efficiency of buildings. If you build a house and you're putting glass everywhere, build a glass house in a tropical environment, you, as uh, Professor Eric uh, mentioned, you need a lot of more energy to cool it and everything. Because, so why don't you do structures that can allow you to have limited need for excessive cooling? That the amount of energy you consume will be reduced. And in the process of reducing, since much of this energy is coming from the burning of the fossil fuel, you are contributing to reducing the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, so without uh, prolonging too much, let us find, first of all, understand, try to persuade what uh, your system is doing, the government into accepting the Ministry of uh, uh, Agriculture, Ministry of Environment in particular, to come up with uh, institutions, Ministry of Transport, you know, all the things that we need to do to understand the value, I think this is important, the value of green infrastructure in the provisioning of ecosystem services. That's the key. The value of green infrastructure is the provisioning of green uh, ecosystem services. Like the road I mentioned about Dangote, the idea is to have a system in which there are a two-layer level approach. Water from the underground will not be allowed to come up, and water from the surface will not be allowed to go in. So the water from the ground will be running into a drainage, the water from below will be going down into another system. So that, that road can keep for about 40 years. And if the road that is made up of concrete cement for the last 40 years, it means the amount of bitumen we'll be using to the surface every two, two years that we used to do, you have reduced it, you have reduced the greenhouse gas emission from that one, and concrete cement will not be emitting as much as asphalt. So all these are very important. So I agree with you, climate finance is important, but there are a lot of opportunities. What we are not doing right in Nigeria is the government is not really helping people to understand the opportunities uh, as existing, and that we should not be looking at climate change as an evil thing. Climate change is helping the world to think a lot of innovations that are coming out now is because of the need to respond. In Germany, as project will have testified, I think you are getting about nearly 30% of your energy, uh, I don't know, in, from, in some cities, from solar, uh, and, uh, the solar panels on the uh, tops of uh, houses. So what prevents uh, us from doing that? That's greening. You know, if you have, uh, in my house, I have a solar panel now, and it's about 20 panels I have, and for the past four or five days where I am, there have not been any light, but I have 24 hour service. And it's not emitting anything. All I needed was just to make sure the battery is okay and everything. Well, maybe the battery is emitting, but it's still be very minimal. And I, thought, and I suggested to the government of Nigeria one time, if you support all top civil servants, all civil servants that have minimum of five years left in their services at whatever level, that have their homes, or even if they don't have your, their homes, if you have a solar panel on where you are renting, whenever you have your home, you can remove it and take it to that place. So it's not that something that the landlord will say, cannot take. So if you support civil servants as a beginning, you can just use it and say, okay, every civil servant, we're giving you solar panel, maybe 10 panels each, that if you can't go to up to 20, the way I did, because mine is about 2.5 million. And then you'll be paying gradually, like a car loan in those days. So every person that works for about five years, I mean, five years left, is able to have a solar panel. And I can tell you, I used to spend about 72 before the uh, price increase in uh, uh, diesel. I used to spend about 72,000 naira a month just maintaining my generator. Today, even with the increase in the price of it, I, I don't spend up to 46,000 for about three months now. It's about 20, maybe 15,000 maximum every month. From 72, 
That's a huge save, savings in terms of my own resources. Although I pay for it I upfront. At the same time, is the inconvenience, the health implication. I don't have to shout at anybody, where is diesel? At the middle of the night, uh, the generator stops. I, I have no clue about that. All I do is to manage the system that I have light 24 hours. And uh, even when my children come for holidays, they don't want to go back to school. So that's the way. And we can make life comfortable. It's so comfortable that I'm living like a 10-year-old child. Easy. I don't want to worry. Where is light? Who took out the light? Who forgot to do this? No. These are all greeny aspects of, uh, of the infrastructure we are talking about. Financially, be okay. But the private sector can be made to do that. There's nothing wrong with this. If by today, all the banks in the country are using solar to propel their servers. But you know, as Professor Murakaji mentioned, some people are used to distributing diesel. Some workers in the bank are making money from diesel distribution. But any attempt by even any innovative uh, MD to say, I want every branch to go on solar will be resisted because some people are making money. So we just have to accept that. Uh, so financing is okay, but let's start with good understanding. When you understand the challenge, Uh, I think Prof is off. When he goes, comes back, we will continue. In the meantime, I see two hands up. Let's give like a minute or so for Prof to come back, just in case uh, he, the question will be uh, will be answered by him. But Professor Marikeji is here. Let me just use the opportunity to quickly read through what I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, Dr. Fashei said. Um, she thanked the professors for their presentation. Uh, she wants to also suggest that there should be a nexus among climate scientists, government and biodiversity experts, taxonomists, botanists, uh, to recommend and encourage the production of specific plants adaptable for tropical environment in a quest to build green infrastructure. That's a suggestion. Professor Elk gave her, uh, her comments there. Um, she also shared a document uh, that we could read. Good. So uh, is Prof back on now? Professor Ladipo? OK. Yes, I'm back. So, OK. Yes. So um, I would say that the finance is okay that we, we can, there are lot of things, we have opportunities for financing, but people have to really understand the landscape and how to approach them. And that thing that I cannot agree with uh, Pasha more than anything else. Uh, unless we have this, and this is one of the things I've only been preaching. If we talk about climate change in isolation, it does not jive. You can see when Professor Eck uh, was talking about and putting in the how people who are modifying the landscape using green plants to do a look for, to make the certain areas that are ugly, make them more beautiful, more refreshing. If you look at your house, for those of you who have homes, if you allow a lot of plants to be around you, the fresh air you get is enough to let you say yes. But you know, because lands are very costly in Nigeria, we want to build 100% of the land and make it concrete, but that's not the way. The law actually says we must leave about 40% for greening. So what nobody cares about that, uh, if you go to Kui, even if it's one meter left, because they can get about 20,000 naira per square meter, they want to build it. So, uh, and, that, and that's what uh, I think Prof is saying, for, uh, for saying that if you can okay. really I'll, have I'll, a connection, you be able to, to build So Ladiko, sorry. There was yes. something you said that I want to quickly take up with Professor Moreni yes. Keji and yourself yes. too. Um, Dr. Please Felicia back. and Salama too, I have seen you. I'll come back to you soon. Let, let's just hear uh, quick responses from the two profs on an issue that, uh, well, um, I don't know if it's over yet, um, but I know the last time I visited Port Harcourt, uh, there was black suit. 
Um, Prof mentioned about having plants around you and then fresh air, you know, and all that. Um, for some years, uh, they, they've, they've been having the issue, the problem of black soot in uh, Port Harcourt. Of course, illegal refineries and all of those things uh, were blamed for all of that. Just a quick one. How do you think outside getting the political will? Because, I mean, you can't, when government refuses to do anything, there's, there's an extent to which you can push. But what of individuals? What can be res residents of Port Harcourt? I deliberately invited uh, some of my schoolmates that actually live in Port Harcourt, hoping that they would ask this question. But I think I, I've waited and I'll ask it myself because it's worrisome. They are literally living and breathing dirty air. And nobody cares because the impact isn't immediate. You know, but I am very concerned because I have people there and I know they are breathing in poison, but they don't seem to realize it. How can individuals uh, do something about this, at least around them? I'll give Prof. Uh, more, uh, Prof. Murray Keji, I'll give you like three minutes to make suggestions or to tell us how we can tackle this thing without involving the government too much because, um, well, they have other things on their mind. Then Professor Oladipo will also come back to you. And Elk, you too, you will also make a contribution in this regard. Um, Professor Oladipo, uh, Professor Maureen Keji, please, just three minutes. Yes, thank you. If it is um, a local problem generated by local people, the residents through their landlord association, they can take an action. But if it's a global problem or a regional problem, the refineries are not located within the city or within neighborhoods. They are in the creeks. And if their effects are experienced in far away in the city, there is little the communities can do. Except the community where the refining is done, Except the chiefs, the traditional ruler in that area can take action to checkmate those who are involved in the illegal refinery. That is how they can get a relief from that. Um, even though government have been sending security men to those illegal areas, what is coming out, what we are reading, what we are hearing, is that even public officials, even military chiefs are involved in these activities. That is why we are saying unless and until we curb corruption in this country, it will be difficult to solve some of our problems. Because what do you do when the people that are sent to arrest people are now collaborating with such people? As for local, problems like a carbon generation through uh, use of a carbon um, generating chemicals and the other things using hydrocarbons. Yes, people know the effects that a cooking firewood in the house can generate this uh, lead to this problem. But then I ask again, when the cost of cooking gas has moved from uh, um, 180 Naira to 850 Naira, what do we do? Let me share a study that we conducted 2006 in MENA. MENA is an urban area. Lot of civil servants and uh, businessmen we found that 74.45, almost 75% of the urban residents were using fuel wood to cook. And a lot of people make a lot of money from there, average of 4,000 Naira per week for selling firewood. And in a year, we estimated 493 million Naira being made from selling of firewood. If there are no alternatives, what do we do? 
So that is the issue. Local people must be empowered. Local people play its own role. That is my view on this uh, issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the best local people. Let, can... let me just add one or two sentences to that. I think you know. Okay. I think one okay. of the things. This is why this your webinar is very important. We, Nigeria has a peculiarity. There's a challenge, and all of a sudden, everybody becomes an expert. The governor will say this is the problem and this is the solution. Meanwhile, has Commissioner for Environment, technical people, and everything that should have tried to talk about the professional aspect. The issue of the suit came and went. Nobody is talking about the suit again. What happened? Is it just because the, the finalists were closed or they, they were able to do that? The answer is no, because they've been doing the legal bunkering and the, the funding for a long time. What we do not know is what the Professor Boric mentioned. Was it generated by local conditions? Was there any change in wind direction that was coming to Port Harcourt that was bringing this suit rather than bringing it over the sea that it used to do? Was there any change in the temperature conditions between the surface and the upper air that maybe allow a lot of sinking of this particulate smoke? If this thing happened in a developed country, there will have been a research plan from a national institution that will be devoted to understanding the courses and the, uh, the, the, the expands the, 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 the effect of the anything seriously in terms of what was responsible and why did the suit disappear if nobody's talking about that. Are there no longer illegal refineries there? There are still the legal refineries. And what happened? So we want to understand, if you don't understand the problem, you will not know how to solve it. And I think this is the challenge of Nigeria. We hardly do go research to understand. That report from uh, Professor Morokeji said, why are they cooking with firewood? The answer is because they cannot afford the type of transition you are trying to cost them. A, a, a 12 kg gas now costs about 10,000 naira. You are paying me 30,000 a month. I cannot afford to buy gas for 10,000 out of 30,000. How do you want me to eat? So no amount of pressure. Even if you have the law, you will either kill me because there's no way I could pay ten thousand naira for a twelve kg gas, which will last me for only one month. So these are issues that the developing nations have to really find out. The issue of climate change. Let us see it as a good opportunity to rework our development pathway towards sustainability, rather than just hard work approach that we're still currently doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Professor Ilk? Ilk, do you have any comment on this? Um, Share your own perspective. You so yeah. much to keep it short. Um, thank you for addressing very crucial questions, but they are hard to answer. There is no easy answer, otherwise you wouldn't have to ask them. Um, in this whole process, I think we should not forget um, we are we're people. We are just um, limited in our knowledge and what we can do, what we need to do. But what we do want to do is we want to stay alive. I think that's just uh, combining everyone in the world. Um, when I grew up, um, I was raised near a coal mining area, steel productive area. The people, some people at least, some companies made a lot of money and needed a lot of workers. And my parents even moved there because they got good jobs in that area. They didn't think about um, bad air quality and pollution. We, we did know that a lot of kids had a bad cough, which was named after the company it came from because of the pollution. And we just lived with air pollution and I think people can adapt to bad living conditions for a longer time than we want that happen. Um, this is one thing and we can always blame politicians um, and, and corruption. We have the same things here, <clears throat> maybe in another um, need. What I 
also think is um, we have a rather older um, community society in Germany at least and probably in a lot of um, Western European countries. Um, you can double your urban uh, population and you're still young. I mean, the, your population in the cities is young. So that is a challenge, a big challenge and um, a possibility and opportunity at the same time, I would say. So um, find the right track. You don't change old people, but maybe you can do and go along much better with younger people. But they, they want to, to survive. They want to be alive. They want to have a good life. And they um, don't, well, maybe we see what is today and um, what can I do today and not uh, work for tomorrow so much. But that's just human. I think that that is um, the case for, for everyone. So in a way, um, I think the area where I grew up improved a lot is very green right now and is very interesting because it has a lot of industrial ruin, ruins which are interesting to see and show people and educate people about what happened and so on um, so it, it just what I wanted to say is not let go but um, work on it because it's not uh, decades ago anymore for for our world and it is really um, just some a few minutes before noon for, for the world's population or for, for our um, world society. Uh, go on and, and um, don't be frustrated, but keep also the trust in what people can achieve on the good side. I mean, this is um, not so, um, so easy, I know, and it is very um, demanding, I think, in your country. But that's why, why you are working so hard on, on the good things. Um, I also think, yes, trees are planted, trees don't really grow well, and trees are cut for firewood. I, I heard that, I learned that. Um, and if you identify the problem, maybe we could identify a solution for that. At least I know that there is a pro um, project where we can put our money to, if we have it, um, that provides African communities with cooking um, devices that needs only 10% of the firewood or something like that. And it doesn't pollute the kitchen or, or the hut where, where they cook because um, they use the wood which is mm, too much. And, and then they also pollute their surrounding, their house with the, with the gases from, from the fire, which is not good. So um, I, I think that these little projects take a while, but can be quite effective maybe. And this also calls for um, what um, the professors already said, um, having, um, a lot of things in mind and um, not only plant one tree, that's not the solution, but um, developing the system in the right direction is, I think, um, still a good way to go. I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm maybe naive, maybe I'm too convinced about that and I know that it's not always going smoothly and, and quick enough but it, I don't see another way than um, to keep going. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the thoughtful, for the thought provoking answer about the attitudinal change that should target the young ones. A number of them are here listening. So I hope you have heard Prof. Now I'll quickly, I'll take two questions that they've been, their hands have been up a while. So we'll take two questions, then our discussants can answer. Then uh, we see how to go, what to do next, because we have exceeded our two hours. So I'll take um, Dr. Salamatu, Dr. Oluchi. Dr. Oluchi, your question, please. After that, we'll take from Dr. Salamatu. 
Dr. Oluchi. Hello. Yes, please. Yes, thanks, uh, Professor Plonia, all the resource persons and uh, the speakers. I, I'm very grateful for this webinar. My question mainly is on waste management because most of the cities in Nigeria are urban slums and they generate a lot of waste. And with the waste management, is there an, a sustainable infrastructure that can be embedded towards climate change and uh, to get us that the, that the management of waste will not contribute to the already trans, uh, I mean, climate problems? Because all the dump sites around, when they are born, they brought a lot of the problem of potacot, I will now tell you, from Choji, from oil fire, from um, the so-called illegal refinery, uh, potacot palace, they call it oil fire. And the, the dump site in Choji and also the fertilizer plant, it was a mixed grill that brought those. But when the governor went around and uh, dismantled all the oil fire around the uh, Protocol City, plus the refinery is not working, the suits disappeared. So that is why I'm saying, is there a way waste management issues that can be integrated, a, a sustainable waste management issue into the climate change so that uh, cities can know how to manage their waste without exacerbating the already climate problem? That's my question, actually. Okay, thank you. Let me quickly take that of uh, the second question from Dr. Salamatu. Hello, good morning. Thank good you very morning. much. Good morning. Uh, I, I also want to join uh, my predecessor just now. Like I wanted to talk about waste management, especially in African cities. Because uh, when you take the case of Miami, for instance, uh, we realized that the heat islands are located in green areas like the green belt and other green areas that we have uh, in the city. And this is mainly due to the fact that these uh, places are usually used to dump as dumping sites like landfills and all that. So it is very important that we take also waste management aspect, uh, especially regarding to uh, African cities uh, like in, in that regard. And the other aspect also, like uh, when we went to want to make an approach like regarding climate change adaptation or mitigation, we shouldn't forget the, the society, like the, the main part, I think, who, who, where we need a total change is with the citizens, is, uh, is with the citizens. So, we need to really sensitize, make a lot of campaign, like sensitize uh, the society uh, about the, all these issues. And also make holistic approach, like call it this holistic approach, show them that waste management, health, uh, food security, everything can be linked, especially in this, uh, uh, in our cities, so that they will take, uh, they will make good intention and also change uh, their attitude towards uh, well climate change or anything else that uh, we do. The the second thing I wanted to to talk about is related to uh, how do you call it? Uh, related to well, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think I will just uh, leave it like that. <laughs> thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, we kept you waiting for too long. Probably that's what uh, made you forget. I hope as we respond to this, uh, what you had in mind will come back. I'll read through what we have in the chat, but for now, Professor Maureen Ikeji, Professor Oladiko, Professor Ilk, you had questions uh, referring to integrating waste management into the climate change discourse, and then how to involve the society so that they appreciate the problems we are talking about and join us in finding solutions. So I'll start with uh, just in one minute, give us your uh, response. So Professor, we start with Professor Ladipo. No, I don't think there's any, 
I, I don't think there's any major disagreement. We okay. all agree that the, the, the challenge of waste management is so critical in Nigerian cities and it's spreading even to some of the rural areas now, though the rural areas are still much cleaner than the urban areas. And one of the aspects of this webinar is to talk about greening the waste itself. If you can green the waste in a way or manner that it can be easier to manage it, that's the starting point. Uh, all efforts being made in some places like Lagos, Abuja, are not really doing anything other than just put everything together, somebody collects it, and then dump it where other people are dumping, and then the government vehicle comes in. Maybe what's the approach is really sad. Okay, what is important is how do we sensitize people to start greening the waste from their source? And at least in some of the developed, I mean, most of the developed nations now, you do not put food items with uh, plastic, with bottles and everything together in a, in a bag and save uh, for somebody to carry to the worst dump. You sort it so that there's a lot of the things that can be recycled, be recycled. There are only a few that cannot be recycled at all that are really taken to landfills. So, how do we build our system to that level that Nigerians can have the essence and understanding of the need to manage their waste right from their sources, right from their homes, in a green manner that make it easier for the government to continue? Otherwise, you just continue spending money. Secondly, I think the government has to go back. There used to be a project in which they, about, they were supposed to have about 29 or 30 uh, facilities all over the country for waste management. And the government is enjoying uh, about 8, mil, 8 million euro project that is talking about waste management, but it's only talking about training, training, training. And I keep on asking the question, how many people are you going to train? What is this training? I go for a workshop, I know that waste is not good, then I have to manage it, but I have no means of doing it. Why don't you use that part of money to have a facility to demonstrate the ability to manage waste very well in a particular city, in which other cities cannot replicate? And I think that's the way. I mean, I'm just you can live in Miami for a while. And that's the same challenge we're having in Nigeria. It's so common to developing it. Okay, go ahead. I think somebody unmuted their video, but I think it's yeah. muted now. So, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Oladi, for sharing your thoughts on that. Professor Mari KG, just a quick one, please. Yeah, just a quick one. I was in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, sometimes ago. I find that what have been problems in Nigeria, the use of nylons and plastics have been solved in that country because you don't buy things anywhere and they package it for you in nylon, but in paper. So I think that's what Professor Ladipo meant by greening the waste right from the source. I also observed that government has been spending a lot of money on small and medium scale industries. I, I think an area that can be encouraged are private people going into waste recycling and uh, waste collection. It will help and it will go a long way. Um, the, I've always been sounding pessimistic because we have been teaching this and we were also taught in school about ways of uh, managing uh, waste, tilting, recycling, and so on. Why have we not advanced beyond just this teaching? The problem is still about centering on uh, poverty. We say that every family in Nigeria today have become a local government. You provide your own security, you provide your own water, you manage your own waste. When you even package this waste, these uh, scavengers will come and scatter it because they are looking for something to pick. Then the problem becomes more. 
All these private people, they are even given the license to collect. They charge exorbitantly and people are not able to pay. So let us start greening from the source. Let us see how we can reduce the use of uh, nylons and plastics, which are non-biodegradable materials. And let us see how people can come and invest in recycling. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Professor Elke? Yes, thank you. I would agree that um, the best garbage is the one that is not produced in the first place. Then you don't have to deal with it as garbage. Um, it's, it's hard for me to, to talk about that in a very short time. I think we are kind of world champions in dividing our trash. We collect paper, we collect glass, we collect different colors of glass. We collect tin cans, we collect um, humus like biodegradables extra and they and, and plastics and, and the, the rest. But um, everything is taken away separately. I think anyone who has visited Germany gets crazy when, when you think about that. People usually don't really understand it. Um, I think that's in a way good because um, the garbage, the divided garbage can um, much better use to make new plastic, new glass out of old material. So there is a lot of gray energy inside the garbage. Um, and for the rest that is not usable anymore, they, they burn it and take away um, the bad gases and so on and produce energy. So um, there, there is, um, an industry using garbage, if there is an industry and um, they get or make money for it, it's, um, it's quite one, one way to go. Still, we have too much of it. To, um, we have plastic a lot, far too much. And it's so easy and we get used to that. Um, it's hard to live without producing any garbage. Um, probably in my country, not possible but a big issue. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing this up and thank you for um, the other answers to, to that point from your point of view. Um, that's probably for now all I want to say, but I, again, it comes to me that education is also a very important clue in this whole discussion, I think, educating people. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just to share an experience or something I saw when I visited Germany. Um, well, one of the Waskal students uh, took me to a shopping mall and they had with him um, a bag with um, you know plastic and all of that. And I was curious. He explained to me that there's this facility in the mall that um, when you put the plastic in there, I, see, I don't know what happens in there, maybe it weighs it or something, but it brings out, it pays you for putting the plastic in there. So I just thought of what Professor Marike just said about poverty, yes. I, I wish we had this kind, this, the, this kind of technology where you can gather all the plastics around you and then put in a bin that pays you. Uh, Professor Elk, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, I saw that and I'm like, I wish I could send such to my country so that people could try that. You, you deposit the, what do you call it? You trash the plastic and then you get paid. I can see your hand is up. Please add some more to that, please. No, I totally understand what you mean. Um, but don't forget that in advance you pay for what you get back. It's not that they give you anything, but people pay for glass bottles and, uh, and give it to give them when they are empty, they give them to people who need the money and they collect bottles and get the money for their daily living. So that, that just happens. Um, but an, another remark, I was um, staying in Cameroon for only six months, but still it was an important time for me um, in the mid-1980s. 
and I was young and I was really um, having a hard time to throw things away because there was no garbage system. And if they, I would dump my garbage to a certain corner where everyone did it, people would immediately come and look at it, what I threw away. And I felt so bad about that, that I um, didn't produce any garbage really. <laughs> so um, I, I think that system was, was quite good. And you buy bread and maybe they wrap it in a little piece of paper, but everything was so natural and not having all these, these um, wrappings of plastic and so on. So not producing things is much better than having this whole machinery behind you but yeah you can bring back some things and get the money from the shops <laughs> thanks yeah thank you very much um okay i think the questions we've dealt with all the questions now i see a comment there that there's engineer engineers will always tell us something engineer elori being elori he says I want us to have it in, in mind that um, every, if everyone is having solar, solar backup at home, how do we dispose of the enormous battery cell in the next 20 years and beyond? So that's his worry that if we have solar powered backups at home, what do we do with the batteries that we will accumulate? in the next 20 years. So that's uh, something we should think about. Professor, Professor Oladipo, I know you mentioned something about solar. So he's asking us that, what if we all have solar and um, we now generate so much battery cells as waste, what do we do? Anyway, that's subject, another, okay, that's subject for another webinar. Maybe we'll think about that. <laughs> Obviously, but there are many ways to dispose their cells now. There are many ways to recycle the batteries. There are even a company in Oka where you, you don't see many of these batteries start outside. You remember you, before you used to see them by roadside. Do you ever see any battery outside again? The companies are recycling them now, so it's not too bad. In the long run, there will be some environmental hazard, but it's not as bad as not having them at all. Okay, thank you for that. So we've taken more than the two hours we had um, intended for this webinar to last. Um, I think if we have, um, I don't know, if we have questions, um, you, can't, you can always get back to us. If you have questions, you can always get back to us. We'll find a way to respond to your questions. Having said that, um i will give an opportunity to our speakers to just in one minute i'm going to time us in one minute just say something to us on this um, topic that brought us here um green infrastructure and urban development in the area of climate change just one minute to round up your own perspective of the topic we'll start with professor elk just one minute, tell us your own perspective. And then, do you think we can handle this in Africa? Thank you very much. Um, it was very inspiring to, to be here. And uh, as I said before, it was also an honor that I was invited. Um, yes, you can do it in Africa because you have to do it in Africa. Where, where should you do it? Um, of course, there's always a way, maybe we don't see it yet until the very end, and we have dreams now that don't come true, but it happens in another way. I think there are big challenges, and I'm very happy that a lot of people are aware of these challenges that we see, and they are very big for you where you are, they are very big for me where I am. So. Um, I think we all have to work together and um, let's do that, please. And um, don't give up. Yes, of course, there's a way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ladipo. 
Thank you very much. I think it's a very wonderful initiative. I, I just want us not to leave here blank like this. I think you are starting a new process in which possibly, I don't know what you can call it, but you can you may decide to call it a Waska Green Infrastructure Initiative somewhere, in which perhaps you start to coordinate, having people like Professor Elk as some of the advisors onto that platform, uh, Professor Mron Keji, the, the, the Saiki, is it now? Who, are, who used to talk about green building too, you know, all those, that they will not be there and then have all these students trying to propagate the need for a national approach to greening our urban environment to avoid future disasters that they may be coming, uh, some of which may be climate induced, others which may be due to our carelessness, as somebody mentioned in the case of Potako, uh, by not managing the environment very well. We should not allow this to die. So right from today, I think everybody that has put it, they are letting them be on a, a, an email or a platform in which we can start to exchange ideas and continue to propagate the ideas to the point that one day, uh, maybe within the next few months, we can have a sort of national support for a national summit on this type of thing, in which Lagos State that is parting, uh, participating in the C40 initiative can share some of the experiences of what they are doing in uh, making the urban environment green and uh, how can other cities copy them. I think Khan is also moving in that direction. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. we need to continue that group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Prof. You Professor Marini Keji. Climate change is here with us. It is a reality. We need to continue educating people to the point that every person will imbibe that mantra. Each person think globally and act locally. Waska is well positioned to do that. Unfortunately, all Nigerian universities, they are reworking their curriculum now, or curricula, as directed by NUC. This is an opportunity also to enrich our syllabus for each course with uh, climate change ideas and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, Professor Kone is still here with us. Prof, you have heard the assignment they are giving us. So if you want to say something in that regard, uh, where is he? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Yes, I. <laughs> I really want to thank you so much, Prof, for, for this uh, great initiative. And also uh, congratulate uh, uh, the presenters, uh, Prof. Egner, for this uh, nice presentation and our colleague. So, and also all the uh, participants. As we said, uh, uh, one of the Prof said, uh, we need to, to, to take this like uh, a new initiative on Waskal or a CCH program where we can also organize some webinars around this topic of green infrastructure and take a lead on that in Nigeria and in West Africa. Uh, we hope that uh, for the next call for the Center of Excellence, we'll be able to be part of uh, the Center of Excellence uh, in uh, this area with the support of Nigeria government. We think also that uh, the record of this meeting also should be uh, maybe put on uh, Waskal or somewhere where any uh, student or the, the, the student coming, the next upcoming student also can be aware of uh, what is going on. Even our uh, Waskal other student and Waskal community should be also learn from this uh, great initiative. Yes, thank you so much. And also uh, I can say uh, we look forward to, to seeing those, this kind of initiative maybe every month or every two months from your side. Thank you so much. Back to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Professor Kone, for your for encouragement. I totally yeah. agree, I forgot this. Uh, okay. We need also to revise our curricula, uh, as uh, it has been said. I know you revised already your curricula based on the input of uh, our professor from Germany. We want to appreciate yes. that. And also, we, are, we keep revising the curricula accordingly. So. Uh, that's a good idea also. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I must say I'm quite happy that eventually this webinar 
took place. Um, we had been planning it since June. So it took six months to materialize, but um, having seen how it's done, we hope to make it more frequent and relevant. We will keep inviting our stakeholders, uh, all of us, because I mean, if, if um, we want to live quality lives, there are things we need to do. So it is important for us to keep educating ourselves until we see change, changes being, um, things changing. So having said that, I want to seriously thank all the participants. At a point, we were like um, almost 60, and then gradually the number came down, but a sizable number is still here, meaning that if we keep on doing this, probably not in the middle of a work day, maybe we will have more participation. So I want to thank those of us that um, logged on and stayed on, and then we will thank others later. We have recorded this session and uh, we will try to see how we can distribute to all of us. We have an idea whom we invited. So we'll see if you're interested, you let us know. You know how to get in touch with me or Waskal. And then you will see what we can do about sending you a video, the video or the recording of the session. So having said that, my colleagues, you're many in here. I don't want to begin to mention names because that will take us some time, but I want to thank you sincerely for joining. I saw something from Professor Ati thanking all of us. Thank you too for being here. Uh, maybe next thing we'll talk about uh, green infrastructure and flooding. I don't know. I know you said a lot. You've done a lot on that online. So um, my students, both well, my current students, graduates of our program, thank you for logging on and listening. Of course, you've heard some of the, the things that came out from this discussion. We are in the right path. So don't think anything is impossible. We have shown you that it is possible. It's now left for you to bridge the gap that made you feel it was impossible in the first place. And that means you have to conduct relevant research. So we are counting on you to do that for the benefit of um, the society, including you being part of the society. My other stakeholders, I see you, my classmates in secondary school, uh, my schoolmates, my uni mates, I see all of you and I thank you for being a part of this. I don't want to mention your names because I don't want to embarrass anybody but you can be sure that anytime we have webinars like this, we will let you know in case you're interested in joining us. So thank you they, very they, much. They know, themselves. they know themselves. They know themselves. <laughs> so, and then to our discussant and guest speaker, uh, I wish to thank you very sincerely and please, don't be tired because we will keep calling on you from time to time to share your ideas with us and we see how we can push them through. You know, once you get something to the curriculum, you're educating people that may need that in the future. So we'll keep reaching out to you, Professor Ilke. Thank you very much. You did a lot to modify our curriculum and um, hopefully we'll get it through to the students as well. Professor Ladipo, as always, you give us a lot of things to think about. Um, someday we'll organize something that um, will, will allow you to talk to us a little bit more about climate change. I know you had to restrict yourself to how that affects green infrastructure. Then Professor Moreni Keji, thank you too for always responding to our call. Um, we'll keep calling on you, so keep making time for us. So having said that, I think uh, we can round up this session until we send out information on the next webinar. Hopefully it won't take too long for us to organize that. Um, thank you very much for being a part of this. And then um, this is like the last part of our, we've been celebrating our 10th anniversary as Waskal in Foot Mina. 
Um, probably very soon, you'll see a lot of that both on wascal.org, the parent website of Wascal, and then our own uh, Foodmina um, website. We'll try to upload some of the things we've done so that you see that um, you see or you're a part of the celebrations that have gone on for the past um, more than a month now. Thank you very much. So in the absence of any other thing to say, I will bid us to have a great afternoon. Enjoy your day and uh, stay in touch. If you have any questions and suggestions for us, please send them. We'll see what we can do about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank, you Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a nice Nadia, day. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. All, all right, ma. Well done. All right. Thank you, ma. You take care. Have, Have a great day. Bye. Yes, ma. So next time, we look at oh, your meeting. Thank you so much, Lonia.